So hi everyone, welcome to the February early stage researchers event for the uh, within the Odyssey community. So this week we'll have Paul with us. So I'll give a quick introduction to Paul. First of all, welcome Paul. Although for those of you who have been to these courses, he will be a known face. Uh, so a quick introduction to Paul. So he's the Director of Education and the Biomedical Informatics and Data Science Graduate Training Programs at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he leads many, many things within Odyssey. Uh, not least with amongst those, he's the co-leader of the Odyssey Open Source Community Working Group, I think with Adam Black, right, Paul? That's right. Um, uh, something we will probably get on to a little bit later, uh, as well as leading the Odyssey Medical Imaging Working Group. He led the DevCon 2022, and I know that there is also going to be a DevCon 2023 coming up, as some people from within the Darwin Project have signed themselves up to give talks there, so uh, I'm sure we can talk about that a little bit later as well. Uh, he's been heavily involved in the development of Odyssey tools, and I think it would be fair to say more on the sort of the development and software side of things within Odyssey. So that would be nice to talk about as well. Um, I think that I've covered everything, Paul, although I will, given your many, many hats, I will give you the opportunity to fill in anything you think that I've missed that would be important. Um, I guess um, I guess the important thing is that I view myself as a scientist. Uh, I am a PhD, I'm not an MD, but I've had the privilege to work inside a hospital for my whole career, and I was trained uh, to partner with physicians. And so because of, because of the, my training and how I started, I've always seen myself as a technical advisor to physicians and helping them embrace new technology. Is kind of how I, I viewed my career in trying to figure out ways that I can uh, create value with them. Okay. So then I guess my first question is, what's your background? What, like, what did you study and how did you get from what you studied to where you are today? Yeah, that would take a few hops. And so I, uh, I, um, I was grew up in New Jersey uh, in, uh, and I grew up near Lawrence, New Jersey, where they had the tokamak fusion reactor. Uh, and so I actually, what's fun about it is my physics teacher in high school would work for RCA in the summers. And so there was a great science community where I grew up in New Jersey. And I would spend my weekends uh, doing some lecture series at the, at the reactor. And I, uh, I really fell in love with physics and science uh, that way. I also found that physics suited me uh, because uh, I don't like to memorize things or I have an inability to memorize things and I like to derive things from first order approximations. And so uh, I love data also. I just, I really love data. I love modeling data to try to tell me what it's, what it, try to see what it's trying to tell me. Uh, what's interesting is I love data and I really don't like EMR data. It's the hardest data to model at all uh, compared to all scientific data and instrument data. Uh, and so EMR is the most complex of all the data I've ever worked with in trying to distill things it's trying to tell me uh, is, is, is actually quite interesting trying to do. So I've always had a love of data. So I, uh, I went to school at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, which is a big computer science school. So I really had, my love was physics and computer technology. I, I find myself on the physics spectrum you have very theoretical physicists, uh, and then you have very applied uh, physicists, and that's really where I was. I actually had my degree in physics and scientific instrumentation, which means I am I am a lab rat. I love labs. I love equipment. I like plugging things in. I like uh, instrumentation and trying to measure stuff. Uh, I have a Raspberry Pi. I've got all kinds of sensors. I am a big fan of of measurement. Uh, and and so I really enjoyed, I got to work in the machine shops. And so I am on the very experimental side of, of physics in that in that realm. Uh, my dream was to go work uh, on uh, in um, on fusion. And uh, the year I graduated college was 1991 was I, I, uh, the year or so that they canceled the United States Texas Super Collider and, and put like 500 physicists on the market. And uh, I decided that was uh, that was uh, that ended up shifting my career prospects a little bit. I ended up working in solar energy for a couple of years, and decided that I really wanted uh, I really wanted to apply 
I found I found uh, this role called a medical physicist, which is a very applied physicist that works inside a hospital, and it helps people, helps the radiologist with CT machines and and MRs and X-rays, and it also helps the oncologist with linear accelerators and and uh, nuclear medicine. So I found that that was a great role, and so I I applied and got uh, accepted into a PhD program at at a medical school, and so I took classes with medical students. And I, um, but I ended up work, I did my graduate career in a hospital. Okay. So one of the things I know is I know how to get around a hospital. First thing I do is I map out all the tunnel systems so that I don't have to take any elevators. Uh, Cause elevators are where you have to wait forever for the patients to go through. Uh, and so I always, I always mind, you'll find that there's always sub levels and sub sub levels within a hospital. It's like the catacombs and, and they're fantastic. There's just so much history down there. And often in radiology, we'd always be put in the basement anyway because we have x-rays and nobody likes x-rays. But now we, we finally become above ground nowadays, uh, but often we were in the basement area. Uh, so uh, just so I also started, I took classes with, with medical students. And, and, and what's interesting about a physician is a physician I find is someone who's very different than I am. They excel at memorization. I found this out when like I had to learn there. I found out there's like 19 steps for blood to coagulate. And like I'm as a physicist, I stop at four. And so that's really about my limit for trying to memorize things. After that, I start deriving them. And so I would have been in so much trouble with physiology if it weren't for the fact there was at least a little bit of calculus in physiology. There's feedback systems like the circulatory and pulmonary systems. And it turns out that a lot of the physicians really uh, had a stigma whenever they saw a sigmoid. And so whenever there was some calculus in there, they uh, really uh, found that difficult. So that was my only saving grace. So all my grades in physiology were inversely correlated with most of the medical students. And so I was able to pass that class and then, and that was my, uh, my, uh, my the toughest class that I had to take there. But then we got into, you know, how energy interacts with the body, and that was a lot of fun. So I, uh, I grew up inside a hospital, inside radiology and oncology. I was there. Uh, I was. This was the early '90s. Uh, I was a graduate student there, and so we had early networks. We had a T1 lines. We had networking was used uh, a little bit. Uh, we had dedicated networks for different manufacturers of our vendors, and of course, I was. Uh, I was the internet for our systems. I would take the system from a worm drive, which is a, a, a optical drive and convert it to a DAT tape. And so I would be basically the conversion system and the network for a lot of our systems within the hospital. And so I ended up, um, that's how I got access to data, which is great. Uh, I really liked uh, radiology. It has got fantastic sensor data and pixel data for medical images. And so I started doing my work on segmenting medical images and uh, building software that actually helped me do automated detection. I was a big fan of geo uh, geometric uh, deformable models for lassoing uh, objects within the body as a as a way as opposed to like region growing and other types of techniques for segmentation. So uh, I grew up in in that in that realm. Paul, I'm really curious to know. So um, you talked about how you had a very physics background but then you sort of found yourself in radiology and oncology. Was there something that um, attracted you towards those two specialties in medicine in particular, or do you feel like it was more of an accident? Um, Cause I know you're so heavily involved in radiology work now. Uh, so uh, I, it wasn't an accident. It's what's interesting about radiology. Radiology has an interesting history. It's a subspecialty of medicine that really came about after the inventions of x-rays in 1896. And so by 1905, they became a specialty where they said, those physicians who look at x-rays, we need them to focus on just doing that. And what they found was is that those they were using like high voltage lines of 100,000 volts with like exposed wires. They you know had issues with getting enough current to run the X-ray machines. You can see some of the early designs. I love X-ray tube history. It's so much fun. Uh, and but anyway, they um, they soon discovered that they really needed to have a technical lead uh, to help them really understand the physics of generation of X-rays, uh, the spectrum, the the penetration capabilities of it, and it really affected image quality greatly. Uh, and so what was really Really exciting was that in I believe the 20s or 30s the field of radiology recognized uh, physicists in medicine as peer faculty. So I wasn't staff. 
I was considered also faculty and a team member. Uh, and so I was always viewed as a team member of the physicians as a peer. And I think this really helped define my relationship with them. Uh, and I liked it because they would pull me in into the reading room and I, and they would see they'd see a smear on an image and they wanted to know, was it physiology or was it an artifact of the imaging system? And that's really uh, and that I would develop phantoms and tests and calibrate the equipment. Lots of fun stuff doing trying to calibrate uh, imaging equipment. And uh, that really kind of and that kind of led me down this pathway of helping them understand how to leverage technology at its fullest and how to make sure that they can compensate for the weaknesses around the technology. And so, yeah, so I think, and, and I think oncology and radiology is really one of the few places where a scientist is part of operations of a hospital. Usually we're doing research and we just get data and we have nothing to do with the operations, but I was actually involved in certifying equipment, making sure maintaining the equipment, doing working directly with the radiologists and uh, as as they worked with their patients. And so I feel it was a different, I, I don't, uh, I felt it was a, really a rare opportunity to be part of the care team. And that was really something that was very special to me where I felt I was able to I, like I said, I'm on the very applied spectrum of physics and I want to see the value of my work in my lifetime. And so I, I really like being part of a care team, even though uh, I have no clinical skills whatsoever. And, and it's one of my great joys is watching a physician use one of my tools. It's like terrifying and exhilarating at the same time is then this actually trying to use one of my tools and caring for a patient because that's you just get enormous value out of that, but also uh, it's also frightening at the same time. It's just like, please don't break. Yeah, Did I you? think that's really. Go ahead, Ross. I was going to say, no, I think that's a, that's a really fascinating angle to then enter into more the informatics or the data science side of things that we do within Odyssey, which is, I think, a lot of people here, you miss a little bit of that in direct influence on the clinic and on clinical practice. So having that experience already, I mean, I know if I think about someone using a prediction model that I built in the clinic, although it's exciting, I'm a little bit scary. What if I've, you know, I've mistranscribed one of the numbers or something like this? Those are the thoughts that go through my head. So I imagine for you having that background, it sort of gives you a much easier step of, oh no, we, I've done this before, we've been here before. Well, also I think, you know, for Odyssey in particular, I think it's really showing really well during Phenotype February, how much we need our clinical partners when how the coding systems are a an approximation of the care delivered to a patient of an approximation of what's happening with the patient and their disease and it's really our clinical partners and how they develop their phenotypes is you see this bridge between the clinical and the technical world uh, and so I, I actually think i think what's great is this month in particular really highlights how incredibly important it is for us to have our clinical partners being part nurse in this conversation for how we describe disease, how we describe the treatment of disease and the outcomes for disease. Because uh, watching the phenotypes being developed on the forums, it's like they're, they're, they're complex because disease is complex. Uh, and there's all kinds of, uh, you know, secondary use cases or, 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 or reasons or exclusion filters that need to be applied or other ways that the data tries to trick you uh, into thinking that the patient has something when they might not have it. Can you talk about some of the work that you do with the working group in Odyssey? Um, I know you co-lead the Odyssey open source community working group, but you're also leading the medical imaging working group. So uh, yeah, what do you do as part of those working groups? So uh, so yeah, let, uh, I'd like to, to just go back just a little bit. So one is I want to talk about uh, my transition into informatics from being a physicist to an informaticist was really uh, was was a big transition point for me. I did want to mention that uh, I got the pleasure to work in industry for about uh, for half a decade. I got to design X-ray tubes, and I got involved with not just X-ray tubes, but with with actually with uh, with Six Sigma and quality leadership. And so I learned that leading change is as much a social activity as it is technology. So I always see myself as a technology partner for a physician. Uh, or a nurse or technologist or any clinical provider. Uh, but I also understand that we have to provide the science of behavior as well as this the technology and data to make impact on patient care systems. And so 
one of the things that I was really proud of was that I worked really closely with my physicians and my radiologists. And I remember the day that I turned into an informaticist was the day, uh, it was a good close friend of mine, was a neurointerventional radiologist. Uh, they had a patient with a bleed, a brain bleed on the table. Uh, the patient had an MR scan from the day before from about an hour north of our hospital, and they had that images on a CD, and we couldn't open the CD. Uh, the CD was in a proprietary format. And here I spent my life trying to separate bad images from good images and trying to improve image quality by a few percent. And I realized I'm, image quality is getting trumped by data quality and proprietary formatting. And so uh, it took us a, you know, an, an hour, but it's too long to crack a CD from a proprietary format. And that's when I realized that Informatics was playing an over much larger role with our physicians and their ability to practice medicine than, uh, than image quality was around the actual images themselves. And so that's kind of one of the one I really mentally made that shift that where I'm needed is on the IT and informatics side, much more than doing film image processing and, and quality control of our imaging acquisition uh, devices themselves. Uh, so that, that was kind of that tran transition period uh, around it. And so I think, you know, uh, I think my goal has always been to support physicians and support physicians with technology and with data. And that's really what led me to Odyssey. Uh, the values of Odyssey spoke very clearly to me about being an open science community. Let's try to do things in a reproducible way so we're not wasting everybody's time and creating unreliable evidence. And so we actually can build strong Lego pieces that we can build upon. Uh, so I ended up, uh, I am, I love data, as I mentioned before, and I, uh, I really helped uh, during the COVID, uh, during, the, during March of COVID is when we had been building this uh, platform at Johns Hopkins on doing, uh, on helping our clinical researchers conduct data science. And so we've built all this big ingestion engine for all of our EMR data and our medical imaging and our waveform and our genomics and our narrative notes. And that was really when uh, we finally were able to say, you know, we uh, really need to build a, a common data model around this EMR data. So we actually, uh, we actually have supported over 200 clinical trials at Johns Hopkins as part of the COVID research. Uh, and so I was part of the, the cadre, which was the COVID analytics data review uh, team where we were supporting these research groups. And really we got to see firsthand, especially with COVID, it's all the mess, all the failures of creating evidence with raw data. Uh, all the challenges in data wrangling and curation, all the challenges in trying to do characterization and summarization, and how that becomes you know just not being able to be reproducible across sites. And so uh, I was very excited to gain the leadership's uh, 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 benefit to be able to lead the OMOP effort at Johns Hopkins. And so that's my goal. So my mission is to bring all my physicians who are trying to lead change in their clinic and to help enable them enable their clinic as a laboratory to bring, to be able to tap into Odyssey, to create phenotypes as a commute, should be done at a community level. And I want them to be able to do network studies. Uh, and so those are really coming my own goals. And so one of the things I enjoy is I love software development and I've worked with software developers in my career quite a bit. And I've always uh, benefited greatly from open source software. Uh, open source software, uh, I've, well, let's just say I've used a lot of software in my life and too many times it's been ripped out of my hands by a company going out of business or upgrading or a new operating system coming around. And so I always feel like I have, you have to invest, you invest a lot of time into learning software and methods and you want that to last. Uh, and so I've decided that I'm, I really, uh, the tools I have have been able to stick with me have been tools that have been open sourced and actually have led to open source communities, not just open source software, which is like freeware, but it, it also, but communities that actually can reinforce open source software by connecting the users with the maintainers, with the hosting providers around it. And so uh, I'm, I'm a, I've, I've actually written several articles on how to build communities on, on open source and build, building virtual communities for it. And uh, it's an area of, of deep interest of mine. And I see Odyssey as an incredible, uh, laboratory to study how we create software together. I feel open source software generation is like the next generation for how work is done. How do groups come together, 
in 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 very uh, a remotely fashion across different teams. How do they form and how do they actually coordinate activities to be able to accomplish new goals? And so I think it's really fascinating to watch open source software development in action, and it's just amazing the impact that it can have. Uh, I think what's truly amazing is 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 just the impact around it. So uh, along with Adam Black, we have begun trying to raise discussions around how can we make network studies routine? How can we deploy the software in health systems routine? One of the things that I do is I work with many health systems convert their data to OMOP. And what I find is, and much to my annoyance, is that they might support the conversion of their data into OMOP, but then they don't use any of the OMOP tools. They don't use Atlas or Web API or Hades or, or Perseus or uh, Achilles or any of the tooling. And so I feel like they're not getting any value back to the health system. So my goal is to use Odyssey to create value within health systems. And so one of my quests is really to to really to drive all my let all my clinicians be able to discover subsets of patients that they have by or using that to create hunches that then they can then validate across network studies. And to do that, I really want to be able to drive value of the Odyssey tool stack into health systems. And, and one of the challenges is the software is too complex. It's not uh, it's not easily bundled together in simple distributions. Uh, and so right now, I think. Uh, we're seeing a lot of opportunity for really making that software a lot easier to deploy and manage and then have network studies being able to be supportable around common distributions of packages of software. Uh, so right now, network studies are a little too hard to implement as well. So we're, basically, we're building a governance model and we're going to be launching a technical advisory board at the next DevCon in April, where, we're, where our focus is going to be security and stability. Uh, and that and the mission so that health systems are very comfortable using our software and that they can then actually use the Atlas tool, which I think Atlas for me is very exciting because my goal is to enable my clinicians to uh, to become scientists and to discover subsets. And so I love teaching them Python and SQL and R. I really do, uh, but not all of them love learning it. Uh, and they shouldn't have to. With a powerful tool like Atlas, they, their questions are incredibly adept and focused on their patients, and they should be able to use data science as a platform of tools, as long as we have you know, statisticians and informaticists that can support them in their study design. Uh, I really think that I just need them I want them to go nuts phenotyping, quite frankly. I want them to find all kinds of outcomes phenotypes. I want them to be validating, doing chart reviews. And I just feel like it is the best way to onboard a new clinical researcher is to let them understand the scope of their data. I call the base OMOP the meat and potatoes uh, of all the main common uh, vocabularies we get. And then obviously the, the physicians are gonna wanna go deeper into phenotyping with, with flow sheets and other data that they're collecting specifically around their patients. But uh, I do feel it's, a, it's, it's part of the journey uh, for a clinical researcher is really see how, is show them how much you can build upon with Atlas and Discover without having to wait on sending a question to someone and waiting two weeks to get a response to it. I mean, I really promote the idea of going from zero to data care to table one, which is data characterization within a few minutes where I just a user can be able to do that without having to uh, without having to delve into the code. And, and I want them to at some point, uh, but they shouldn't have to uh, as really, I think, where we're going as a field. And so one of my goals with open source is to really make the software production and ready. And, and I mean, it's immense with 13 million lines of code in Odyssey. Uh, it is already delivering enormous value, but I want it to be deployed into community hospitals, into low resource areas where they don't have a data scientist necessarily or uh, or a you know a programmer or, or a SQL person. I want to be able to have it where they can then do basic tooling and understanding of their data without having to have as many technical skills. So that's on the open source side. On the the imaging side, I'm getting very I'm very excited about because I love pixel data. Uh, I I love images. I feel like well, and I of course just growing up in radiology and being involved with segmentation and deep learning, uh, it is a new a whole new frontier for creating incredible features for describing disease. And what's amazing about radiology is we get 
a lot of, we can create incredibly sensitive organ-based measures on how effective is the treatment. We can, we, we're probably one of the best gauges for affecting a, treat, a treatment effect or, sur or surgical intervention effects. So I think from, for getting better and more granular phenotypes, imaging is the next great domain. And the reason I say that is because imaging is actually highly structured. How the images are created, all the field of view, all the acquisition parameters, how it's archived as a medical record within the PAC system, which is kind of like an EMR for images. And so it actually is a perfect data source for Odyssey to, to link EMR data with. Because one is it has a more granular phenotypes that can get us at the organ level, that can get us really into sensitive uh, looking at outcomes. And then on top of that, it's also highly structured as opposed to things like um, narrative notes, which is really hard because it's got, it's, it's, you have to use NLP algorithms around it, as opposed to waveforms. Waveforms don't have a clinical archive that in common use for storage, uh, and, nor do, and nor do genomic sequences. Sequences often are, don't have a great protocol for, for transmission, and so they're not generally archived in a central place. Uh, and so right now we're seeing uh, imaging, I think, is the most mature data source outside of the EMR to, to marry with, with EMR data. So that's why I'm working with uh, Seng Chen Yu from uh, Yonsei University in South Korea. And we have built uh, some very simplified uh, extensions to OMOP to bring in two big things. One is the imaging study. So we can say, hey, what images did this feature come from? Or I wanna find, find me all the patients with a cerebral hemorrhage that have had a CT scan within 10 days and the CT scan had, you know, one millimeter slice thickness. So we want to bring image acquisition parameters into cohort discovery. And then the second side of this equation is what we're going to do is we're trying to bring image features. As we run a segmentation algorithm on lung nodules or on any feature, we're going to create loads of new measurements. And when we create those new measurements, say we have a lung nodule and the lung nodule has uh, a size, a different dimensions, it has a uh, 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 characteristics around speculation, has characteristics around ground glass or other classifications around it that we want to add each of those as measurements into the measurement table, but we have an imaging finding table, and that table actually maintains the provenance of where all of those uh, features are, all those new measurements are coming from, what algorithm created them, or and what images were used. So we're hoping to be able to have it fully automated where an algorithm could go and create new features and we could actually have that completely reproducible in, in how we test our segmentation algorithms. And so I'm excited because I think imaging is really a, um, an exciting new domain for Odyssey compared to, uh, compared to all the other opportunities that we're having uh, for being relatively ready, shovel ready, having vocabularies like Radlex and DICOM, having structures that we can leverage and have, actually having the data available within most health systems because of their own regulatory constraints. So because your goal has always been to support physicians with reading data and technology, and obviously Odyssey is such an interdisciplinary community and there's people from all expertise, how do you think physicians can support your work? Like how, how can they um, optimize their value in Odyssey and, and, and you know, sort of, um, help you improve open source work or imaging work? Um, yeah, what role do they play? So uh, it's interesting because they have, they have the hard work. And actually, I have they have to do five roles for me. They don't have to just do one role. There's five things I need from physicians uh, to help them. I want them to pull me into their world. And to, I want them, you know, of course, I want them to have the problem. I don't see patients. They see patients. They see, they get frustrated with trying to use technology like EMR and diagnostics and trying to summarize what's going on with their patient. And so I need them to come up with the problem and the question and the hypothesis. Why are these patients responding differently? That's what I, that's what, I need them to come up with the questions and that's, that's invaluable. Uh, so I need them to have that mentality. I also often really need them uh, so that, that's that's the first thing I need from a physician. The second thing I need from a physician is I need them to have a student mentality that they have got stuff to learn. And that is that they, they 
this methodology is fantastic. I won't tell them how to do their clinic since I have no clue, but uh, the stuff that, uh, but Odyssey has built a whole amazing mechanism for them to build upon, but they're gonna have to learn how to use the building blocks of the vocabularies and how to create phenotypes and then how to ask questions around that. And that takes that takes time and energy to learn how to do it. So I need, uh, so I, I asked for, uh, I also need them to be a, a partner in that as we, what, what we want to do is we want to find a subset of patients. And so we want to build a predictor for that subset of patients using Odyssey. And we want to create evidence in Odyssey. And then I want to have them bring that back as a decision support tool in the clinical care. So those sets of patients get either don't get surgery or get a different test or are, are identified so that we know what, to, so we have a better clue what to do with them. And so that is actually the really hard part is bringing evidence back into clinical care to evaluate, does it improve the lives of the patients? So they have the hard work of actually, um, and for me, and this is part of the partnership is they have to learn how to be a leader and, uh, and, and influence their organization, their peers on using these new CDS tools that are bringing that predictor back into clinical care. So that's actually an important thing that we teach them is what I call the, the uh, how to do organizational behavioral psychology of how to deploy these tools and how to lead that in there to evaluate it to see if it's actually benefiting the patient. And so that's a, a ton of uh, that's a ton of work to do, but that's where the real value is, is when we bring evidence back into medicine. And so I've been really excited about the developments with uh, with Odyssey, with how we describe evidence in Circe, and how we can then convert that into real-time fire objects using clinical query language. And so I see those two, that those working groups is the marriage of taking evidence in Odyssey and bringing it into real-time decision support using fire. And so I'm uh, very excited about working on those projects. We've got a couple of, of very interesting demonstration projects trying to trying to show just that. But that's a tough role for any physician is to learn how to lead and how to actually deploy a tool. Uh, we can handle the technology aspects, but there's going to be understanding the evaluation of it. And then lastly, uh, you might think this is easy, but I also need them to be a scientist. Uh, everyone falls in love with their creation. They think that their predictor is awesome and that they put so much of their life into it that they know it's going to be successful, but they also have to be a scientist in how we evaluate them. In, and they have to be cold-blooded in our evaluation of how do they truly impact the lives of our patients. Do they help them reduce the uh, uh, st uh, the stress of a diagnosis? Do they help them with the treatment options and how and the information overload of getting their first cancer diagnosis? Uh, how does it actually benefit them? And, and how can we really measure that? And that is the implementation science that has to go along with any deployment. So that's so what, what, the, what I want from physicians is an awful lot. What I can give them is data, data science, and a methodology to answer their questions. Uh, but it really has to be a partnership uh, between uh, between the physicians. So that's really, uh, really what I like. Uh, one of the reasons that I really enjoy Johns Hopkins is because Johns Hopkins was founded to train physicians and scientists and to let them use their clinic as a laboratory. And so that's part of our mission. So I can, so I can always say, hey, this is our under, we're just supporting our mission here, and this is what we should be doing. And so uh, enough physicians buy that story uh, that uh, that I get to have a lot of fun. So in addition to some of the challenges that exist between uh, leveraging like the expertise of both clinicians or physicians and scientists and researchers, what are some of the major gaps that you still see in informatics and data science fields, especially since you've taught and you've led at so many different institutions, including Johns Hopkins and, you know, in Wisconsin and so many places. So, um, yeah, what are what are some of the the barriers um, in applying in initiatives to clinical care? Always, uh, so um, this the biggest barrier is is still empathy uh, between the clinical and the technical worlds. It is a lack of understanding of of what actually goes on inside a hospital. And so I call the boundaries of a hospital a, a reality distortion field because people don't understand how medicine is practiced. Most engineers, uh, most scientists like to think of a rational world where things are linear and decisions are made uh, in a in a uh, in a fashion where you have all the information and you get, you make a decision. Where in truth, medicine is delivered in a very reactive, disruptive, 
phase where drips of information comes out over time. You're trying to form a theory about the patient, about what you think is going on. And so you're basically converging on a diagnosis, but you're in a very reactive world where you're seeing how they're responding to. And so under, understanding how decisions are actually made is, uh, is requires a, a level of empathy. And so I, that's one of the reasons uh, I'm really happy to train our informaticists. And I feel a lot of a key part of their training is their ability to go into a hospital and go have a Vulcan mind meld with a physician and make sure that and understand how that can be a partnership. So I try to create as many opportunities as possible for these two to interact. I don't, I, what I fear and what I keep seeing is that cross section of interaction decreasing, not increasing. Uh, I feel the value is like if I can put an engineer and a physician together, sooner or later, some magic is going to happen because they got they get they get, they, they start by often talking past each other, and it takes a while for them to develop uh, an understanding for how to communicate the art of the possible, which is technology, and the understanding of the problem, which is the physician. So often both both sides misunderstand their role, and the physician thinks they know the problem. Uh, and they know the solution, and they often understand only a perception of the the problem, and then their idea of the solution is a very in the box type of way of thinking. And so, trying to apply creative, you know, design thinking activities around that, where where and then of course the engineer wants to have a solution for everything, uh, but they really need to understand the problem. And so, I try to teach the informaticists this mantra that uh, all software developers know, and that is. Uh, build twice because you will anyway. Uh, and that is you really don't understand the problem until you try to solve it because you're discovering what the problem is uh, in your attempts to solve them. And that's really a hard thing to sell to a product manager when you're building a product. Uh, but that's the truth of really building dynamic solutions that are going to really improve the lives of our providers and their ability to care for our patients. But I like it because it's also a core mantra of any open source developer because we know this, uh, and that's the, the we're not we can't be married to our software. That's why we leave all of our the software is in the public square. It's our dirty laundry's out there, and so that's part of the humility that we gain as an open source software developer. So if you talk about um, the the issues, or I guess we could we could frame it in a more positive way, sort of what we could learn from in these in these ideas of like communication where would you like to focus upon if we if you take your odyssey education hat and you think okay so we've got a great open source work open source development community and we've got a lot of very sort of motivated smart and talented doctors how can we best educate those two groups of people to be able to communicate more effectively with each other without having this step of you know first miscommunication and then moving towards a common understanding how could we sort of create an efficiency in that process well, anything that increases the cross-section of interaction uh, will improve that. And so I get very excited when I see partnerships between engineering schools and health systems. Uh, that, that That's really needs to be more common. What I would like to see in Odyssey is I would like us to be running a thousand network studies a year. Uh, and it, to my knowledge, we've only run about 50 in our history. And so we need to make network studies routine. And that means we need to be, and we need to be having cattle competitions where we have, hey, we've got a whole team of engineers. They don't, they need to have a physician. And so if you're a physician with an idea, we'll give you, we'll find you a virtual team that can help you run your network study. And so we've got lots of graduate training programs where they need to get access to a clinician. Uh, and so we need, and we've got a lot of health systems with clinicians with without any engineering resources. And so if Odyssey can solve that problem and, and a network study is the perfect way to do it because we're not talking about PHI. We're not talking about centralizing data. We're talking about on, you know running a question across a network. And so this is, I think in some, I, I think this would be an, an incredible way of harnessing what, of creating new evidence uh, by being able to really be able to lower that barrier for and connecting physicians with questions uh, on a very regular basis with teams that are willing to put in 100 to 200 hours as part of a, an assignment or as part of a competition where they get public recognition, you should see how many, there are career cagglers now who are just incredible at, and they jump on any competition they can get their hands on because it's really become, uh, it's become an exciting way of doing open uh, citizen science. And so tapping, so for my, you know, I want to see Odyssey tap citizen science because it's ideally suited to do so. 
And uh, I think that the keys are trying to find, you know, trying to build on ramps for clinicians to gain practice in riding the bicycle and to be able to give them access to engineers on a much larger scale than I can do within a within one and within one informatics program. I, I, I try to tap our engineers from our School of Engineering, our our statisticians from our School of Public Health, but still it's the engine is something that we could create on a much larger scale. Uh, and, and that's where evidence has to be created. It has to be created by uh, across institutions. It, it has to be done by consensus for us to create real evidence. But that's really where I would like to see Odyssey be. Uh, and the focus should be, and I think the way to get there is for us to be constantly vigilant of how many network studies are we doing. And the answer is, is we're not executing that network enough uh, to really get to, uh, to be running the scale that we need to be able to create that community. One thing that we haven't talked about much is how you're also leading the biomedical informatics and data science um, at Johns Hopkins University. And I think since this is the early stage researchers working group, I'd love to know like what skills and technical knowledge you're trying to instill in your students and that you would recommend early stage researchers try to develop as they pursue these fields. Yeah, I have I have four technologies that I need every informaticist should have in their tool belt. Uh, and that might not be true for all observational researchers, but uh, I think that the first two are, and the first one is, it's amazing how uh, I don't think schools of public health really teach this well enough yet, nor do informatics programs, uh, is SQL. Just, it's a very old language, but it's the language of data. Uh, it, and this is, the this is really how you communicate ideas and how you understand, formulate questions and answers. And so SQL is actually fundamental in how we structure data models. So I do feel SQL is, is really, under emphasized in formal education and it needs to be if you if you remember listening to Asia and and Jenny Lane and all the other great earlier uh, people you've interviewed often they went through their formal training program without any exposure to how to work with data and that seems like a mistake uh, and so I think SQLs number one for me is I I like informatic I have four main tools that I want each informaticist to learn one is SQL. The next one is OMOP, is having a CDM to exercise it. So understanding the OMOP CDM, which combines clinical vocabularies, which are our, our units of knowledge, and how we combine that knowledge to build uh, evidence and reason. And so for me, it's it's a perfect combination of having two incredible a data model with, with a vocabulary along with uh, the technology to use it. The other two that I have, I think are probably might be more specific to informaticists, uh, but one is I do think it's really important for our scientists to know either Python or R. I think it's just so critical for data wrangling. It's so critical for understanding how the open source uh, machine learning is so good in R and Python. It's ridiculous how some of the, the best algorithms are being contributed by Facebook and Google, and they're all open source. All the imaging stuff that I do and deep learning, it, the best stuff is open source. And so it's just amazing that before, you know, when I started my career to get access to high-end algorithms would be very expensive. And now it's actually the best stuff out there is the stuff that's open source. And um, I think that's fascinating. Uh, and, so, and so in addition, uh, the last thing I have is I really teach my students is FIRE, which is FIRE is how we talk about interoperability of our systems and we communicate about a patient. And so it's really, it's just a restful service for how we query and how we message between our systems that I want to have a piece of information. And so I think FIRE is actually, is going to be critical in Odyssey for how we create, I would like to see a fire server for all of our phenotypes so that they're electronically queryable, so we can then apply them into our evidence systems. And so fire is basically an internet restful service built around medical objects, like an observation and a patient and a provider. And so it actually is a very, it has a lot of granularity that allows us to do real interoperability, but it is a, uh, it's a way of, of, of converting across between the two. So uh, those are the four main technologies. From there, it's easy for me to go into deep learning with images, to go into NLP, to go into survival analysis. And so, but I think with those four skills as informaticists, they have what they need from a technological data science perspective uh, to be able to understand the technology necessary. That's not necessarily the, the social, uh, the, the, the influencing psychology skills they need to be leaders and working with clinicians, but it is the, the, the on the technical side, uh, the useful pieces of it. 
I see, just so you know, I see there's two sides. There's the technical leadership and then there's what I call the uh, organizational psychology. And so there are two sides to the same coin of leading change within a health system, understanding how to influence and behavior. And there's actually sciences for, for habits. You'll see there's lots of great models out there now for, for, uh, for influencing behavior. We, I actually used one of the major models for influencing behavior for how we created our Hopkins Odyssey Research Community Center, understanding people's different sources of incentive and, and being able to then tie them together and to build a, uh, a more impactful uh, intervention. I think actually the comment you make about the best algorithms for doing for doing machine learning today being available open source actually speaks to the power of having an open source community. Because I think actually another really good example of this is the programming language R that you mentioned. So if you look back at the history, originally this was called S for I think it was basically a statistical programming language. This got taken uh, out of open source and then after that sprung up R because the people who used to use S and were very happy with it decided, oh well, we want to build this. And, I think it speaks really nicely to this idea of you need it, you need to have a community. So, so outside of one company or a collection of one or two companies or academic research institutes, to actually have a much broader community means that you'll be able to drive this development forward in a much more effective way. Yeah. What, what I know is that uh, no one can take it away from me, and so that I, 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 I it will last. It will it'd be the last technology I need to learn. Although I I, I sit more on the Python side because that's where more more of the imaging computer science came from. And also, I find it's amazing. I can, is how many incredible libraries I don't know about. And so, whenever you first when you find a problem, you say, "Oh my God!" They someone built a whole library just to help me solve this one problem. And so, it is. It is really is amazing when you see a, a successful community really growing and thriving because you're right. You, you keep discovering new and new capabilities within that technology. What are some of the important leadership skills that you think can help us apply data science to medicine because you're such a leader in the Odyssey community? So I, uh, I mentioned empathy is always really important. I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I also would say, you know, understanding facilitation skills. So I, I started in high school. I love philanthropy. I started at the Red Cross. I did Habitat for Humanity, and I, I think I learned some of my best management skills there. Because if you, I always, I always thought that if you know how to manage volunteers, you could manage anyone. It's my, actually I, I have 60 people underneath me at Johns Hopkins, and you treat them. If you understand progressive management, you treat them as volunteers because they put in their hours for you, but that doesn't mean they're going to give you their heart. And so, understanding uh, under, leadership skills is really about understanding uh, the uh, the. Uh, motivations of the people that are on your team and helping them accomplish those motivations. And so really any community working group should be a, a bunch of people who are advancing their career, doing things that excite them, uh, that fulfill their purpose of being uh, can, being meaningful impact. And so uh, if you look at, you know, uh, uh, I think Dan Pink's model for uh, motivation, I think it works out really well. One is well, there's three poles of motivation uh, in Dan Pink's model. One is uh, purpose. Why are we doing this? Uh, I brought, doing what we're doing here is the most strategic thing I could be think of doing, creating evidence in medicine and doing it reproducibly. Another one is mastery. Uh, so purpose and, and mastery is so when you get to learn new skills. Has there been a day in Odyssey where you haven't learned something new? Have you been on a community call where you haven't learned something new? And so I find that you know, uh, uh, so so mastery is is a great way of of um, of being able to have uh, is a great way of learning new skills. And the third motivating poll is autonomy that you have flexibility in choosing how you solve your problems. And so therein lies uh, open source is so wonderful in that we provide different. You can solve your problem with the newest tools. We're not forcing you to use data. We're not forcing you to use a technology from 20 years ago. Uh, or we're actually allowing you to use having autonomy. So this is uh, there's a great book called Drive by Dan Pink, where he studied what motivates people. You'd be shocked that money wasn't the any of the motivator. It was actually the major dissatisfier when you people when, when you know that people work with you or not as qualified as you are, make more than you, then it's a major dissatisfier. It's actually not a motivator. 
Uh, but it was it's a really good book on understanding what motivates individuals. And if you understand what motivates people, then that really is understanding how to be a good leader is is helping them accomplish their own goals and and seeing how what the role they play is helping you move make move forward as a larger initiative. And I think what's nice is Odyssey is perfect. It lines up uh, mastery, purpose, and autonomy incredibly well uh, with uh, with people's career goals. Your leadership skills something that you're constantly developing, and has it always been something that you've been? So you, you mentioned that sort of back when you started in high school, you did a lot of sort of like volunteer work. But is it also something that you've paid particular attention to developing over the course of your career? And so, how have you gone about doing that? Is that through you know reading books, different literature, following courses? Yeah, I am. Uh, I am an avid reader. Uh, I I used to have a commute of about an hour or two hours a day, and so I would listen to a ton of audio books. Uh, and so I certainly enjoy, uh, but I, I now love YouTube. I learn a lot from YouTube. It's a, I learned Odyssey from YouTube. That's how I, actually the values of Odyssey called to me from YouTube. Uh, I went through over 40 hours of tutorials uh, before I talked to a single person within the Odyssey community. And I didn't just get a sense of the technical things, but I got the invitation in the tone of their voice, in the tone of how they're trying to communicate, bending over backwards to try to teach you how to do this any way that you can, uh, and their inclusiveness in the process. And so uh, I found that that really, uh, that I think, of course, being in, you know being interested in learning uh, is always uh, is always a, a key aspect of things you would want to look for in in an employee is someone who has has uh, has a curiosity around that. The other thing I'm learning, the other thing I wanted to mention, and, and, and there's some great books about this, but uh, I have been, worked in four or five different organizations in my career. And what I enjoy is working with other people that I enjoy. Uh, and actually, that's actually a hard life lesson to learn is that one of the best gifts I had early in my career was I got to be on a high performance team. What is a high performance team? High performance team is a team of specialists that trust each other and are going to go going after the holy grail. And so that is so much fun. I, when I was a GE, I was part of an, a team that I was the physicist. I did the imaging, electron optics. I had a mechanical engineer, electrical engineer and they would do vibration analysis, they were doing stress analysis. And so it was so much fun because uh, I didn't necessarily know a lot of what they did. I could appreciate it, but I it was really fun trying to work together and doing it with a deep level of trust. And so there's nothing better than being able to work with a team that you love to work with. That's like your best gift of finding a job where you enjoy what you do and you enjoy who you do it with. And actually another reason I love Odyssey is the working groups are my way of saying these are the teams. These are, I I love working with these people. Let's find an excuse of something to do together so that we can make a difference. And so uh, I do feel like that is really one of the understanding teams is really an important aspect uh, of because you cannot learn everything. You can't even come close to learning everything. You have to build a great team in your career and your life of other people that you can learn from, uh, and that is. Uh, and, and especially in a, and I think Odyssey epitomizes it because it's such a multidisciplinary field where with informatics, statistics, and analytics, and clinical medicine boiled into one body. So I really like the fact uh, that I get to have exposure and get to be part of high performance teams. And it's the nice, the benefit is you're a volunteer. And so if you don't, uh, if you're not enjoying the in, the environment or or the group you're with, you're obviously not going to stay with them. Uh, and so it's really an important lesson to learn as any working group lead of how to try to create that environment that you enjoy enough uh, that you know, other people would enjoy it with you. One of the things I do for the classes that I teach, and uh, Star will attest to this, is that I I change my curriculum every year for the classes that I teach because I need it to be interesting for myself. And so I find I bring in new speakers. I bring in, uh, I, I just want to make it entertaining. So I enjoy my classes as well. Uh, and so I certainly enjoy the students learning it, but I also like, um, I like learning, I like to use it as a, as a forum for, 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 for learning as well. Yeah, that's really helpful. 
I guess before we open it to the audience, I just want to ask you one more thing, which is what are you looking forward to in 2023? Are there any new projects that you're working on or things that you want to share? And then we'll open it up to the audience. Yeah, I, I haven't showed this to the steering committee, so don't tell them about this. But one of the things we're doing is I'm going to be adding some major new features to the community dashboard. It's going to be completely overhauled in about four weeks, and we're going to be tracking network studies. Each network study is a GitHub repo. Each GitHub repo has a template for its network study. Each network study has different stages like creation, study design, uh, data collection, and results availability. And so we're now going to be studying all that we've now harvested all that data. We're now building a dashboard that tracks the network studies. Some of them go off like a rocket and they go from stage to stage very quickly, especially the ones in COVID using uh, a crib disk. However, a lot of network studies, they die on the vine. They never get the data partners. They never get enough critical mass. And so I want to expose and study network studies so that we, as a community, say, this is our goal. Our goal is to create evidence. The way to create evidence is network studies. So we need to be focusing on this as an important aspect of our, the truth is that's where do papers come from? Papers should be coming from network studies. And so we're gonna be adding all these fun diagnostics around network studies for the time to the next stage. Is it keeping its momentum? In, in a network study is, you know, is the network study adding a new data partner? Is a network study uh, doing some complex phenotyping? And then also trying to capture all the artifacts around a network study, the protocol, the cohort definition, the results, all these things need to be publicly available and along with all the phenotypes uh, so that we can kind of then show the science of how to do a network study and build uh, rails and community around that where people see that as something that everyone still thinks it's un inapproachable and too difficult and too hard. And, and I think this will be a big step in us making it more routine. But don't tell the steering committee. <laughs> I think that sounds that's something that sounds fantastic to me. I can't wait to see the results of that, uh, and I'll make sure that I don't mention it when I uh, have a conversation with Peter later on this afternoon. Uh, I think we've got one minute left, so I just wanted to check if anyone from the audience has a burning question for Paul. I'll throw you one question. Um, there's so so much. Um, so much useful information shared that I really want to thank Pod and thank Raj and um, um, Frida to organize this. Uh, you know, you have been, Paul, you have been in different uh, organizations. I feel there's uh, a huge challenge for uh, data scientists to access data, even for clinicians to access data. I feel you are in a special place with John Hopkins. So uh, there are lots of research I want to participate to be a data partner and so on. And that's a huge challenge. Maybe perhaps you can provide some tip. How can we I, break that through? I do. So I have worked for many organizations and one of my best goals is what you need is you're going to need an organization with a good culture. Why? Because the success of that organization depends on its people that work there. And so actually, it's funny, I looked at all these metrics for all these different organizations, and I end up boiling down to is if you look at an organization, look at their Gallup score. What do their employees rate their company as? That's probably one of your best gauges. And then understand, and then basically see, and then when you interview with that company, see how much, what, how are they empowering uh, their employees? And so one of the reasons I like uh, Johns Hopkins, and I chose it specifically, is it's an inter- uh, uh, interdisciplinary medical center. Uh, it's an integrated medical system. And what that means is in the US, we have this terrible thing where the professional fee uh, goes to the physician group and the technical fee goes to the hospital and they might be different organizations. And so leading change is really hard when you've got an, a large organizational boundary between your physicians delivering care and the hospital that's actually responsible for where they deliver that care. And so an integrated medical system is where they put that all into one bucket. And so I found that that's, it's easier to align and do systems-based re-engineering and changing of care uh, in an integrated medical system. And so I'm hoping that's a model for the future. And I think it's one of the reasons why the, the employee uh, you know, satisfaction scores are, are generally going to be higher because there's less tension and friction between the two organizations.
just a, a U.S. phenomenon, I guess. I just wanted to say thank you for the great talk and thank you for all of your comments, but especially the comments about the um, sense of purpose and instilling a sense of purpose in the people you work with and how there really is nothing more motivating than that and more important and just what a difference that makes between working on a team that has a sense of purpose versus somebody that's there because it's their job. I, I do think purpose is the most important of the three motivators, but you should never ignore mastery or autonomy either. Those are also people need to grow uh, they uh, and they need to have choice. Those are two things that are also shouldn't be ignored. Absolutely. Thanks, Paul. Paul, how can people contact you if they have more questions or if they want to get your advice or input on their career trajectory? So I love Microsoft Teams. Uh, you know, I like my, uh, I have an Odyssey account, Naji at odyssey.org. You can get hold of me on the Odyssey Teams tenant. That's probably the easiest way to get hold of me because uh, that's where I live. Uh, you know, that, that's why I would recommend anyone to reach out to me there. Uh, or, you know, if you can send an email to that address as well. Okay, fantastic. So we're at the top of the hour, actually three minutes over the hour, but you know, we've had so much to talk about. I think you'll have to forgive us for that one. Uh, so I'd like to say thank you very much, Paul. I, I think everyone that's been here today has really appreciated your input. And I think I know from a personal note, I also really appreciate your input, both within the Odyssey community, the wider Odyssey community, and also within the early stage researchers working group. So thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing everyone in March. Thank you, Paul. Ross and Pfizer, thank you guys so much. You guys are doing such a wonderful job with this group. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Take care. Bye. -bye.